Hello everyone. So if you're watching this, it means that the unit 2 test is afoot. Um, and so this serves as the review guide for unit 2, which covers chapters 4, 5, and 6. Now this does not serve as a PowerPoint or, sorry, a video um, in place of all the other videos for all the different chapters, because I'm going to be going through it quickly. Um, but this kind of goes over just a little bit of what we've covered in each of the chapters, which you might see on the exam. Um, but to help not distract you, uh, my beautiful face is going to be disappearing. Um, and again, I'm going to be going through it quickly because this doesn't serve as replacing the other videos for the different chapters. Just This is just a quick review. So let's get started. All right. So... As mentioned, we're starting with chapter four, which was all about consciousness. And the most important thing to start with about consciousness is what we mean. And so what we mean by consciousness is a state of awareness of ourselves and the world around us. So for the sake of this class, that is how we define consciousness. So just being aware of what's around us. And when we talk about consciousness, there's different types. You have focused awareness, drifting consciousness, divided, um, sleeping, which we get into more detail later on, and then waking states or altered consciousness. Um, and I would especially focus on that altered state of consciousness, which is, if I can, yeah, down here, and some various examples. So, like, if you are under drugs, um, under the use of drugs, um, if you are hypnotized, if you're meditating... Things like that are all examples of all altered states of consciousness. Because uh, I can tell you right now on the exam, it'll give you all these different types, and you need to find the odd one out. Um, I would also focus on when it's talking about divided consciousness, and how that is when your consciousness is truly divided. And so it's split between two different things, whereas drifting consciousness is when it goes from one thought to another. If you're doing two things at the same time, though, that's divided consciousness. Another thing you'll need to remember um, is your circadian rhythm and what we mean by that. And that's kind of just that daily regular fluctuation that we have. Um, it's a pattern of fluctuation within, roughly speaking, 24 hours. Um, it's also kind of known as your biological clock. And another thing to remember about your circadian rhythm is then what is essentially in charge of um, your sleep-wake cycle, which is a part of your circadian rhythm. And that part of your brain, which you will need to know, is the suprachiasmatic nucleus, or the SCN. Um, so that's what helps to control your circadian rhythm um, and also that sleep-wake cycle. Speaking of sleep, we're also looking at the stages of sleep, and you will never, for the sake of this class, need to know, you know, all the different stages, all the different waves, stuff like that. Um, but things to focus on in particular is when you look at the second stage of sleep, um, up here, is where you see these things known as sleep spindles. And the way that I remember this is I think sleep spindles second stage. It all starts with S. Um, so just remembering that we see these sleep spindles that happen in the second stage of sleep. Um, going on, other things about sleep is why we sleep. And this will be another kind of question where it gives you all these different options. Most of them are right. One of them is wrong. And so knowing kind of the theories as to why we sleep will help with that question. So it serves as a protective function. It serves to conserve energy. Um, similar to that, it helps to restore us. And then finally, it helps us to consolidate memories, um, which we talk about more about memories and this idea of consolidation uh, in the last chapter in this video. So keep in mind that consolidation. Um, but those are all the different theories out there as to why we need sleep. When it comes to interpreting dreams, which is a part of sleep, there's different theories out there. So one of them is by Freud, and you'll see he's mentioned a few times in this video. And he had this whole idea of what we know as our manifest content and our latent content. Um, so your manifest content is just what you're dreaming about. It's what's manifested itself in your dream. Whereas your latent content is then the hidden meaning of it. So what does it mean, you know, that I had this dream? Um, if I have a dream about a crow, what does a crow represent? 
that would be the latent content, whereas just dreaming about a crow is manifest content. Um, so that's interpreting dreams with Freud. Another theory out there is the activation synthesis hypothesis. And this is the whole idea that there's random activation um, or random firing in our brain. Um, and so we try to make sense of that, and it comes out in the form of a dream. So it's kind of combining or synthesizing that firing or activation, um, which then forms into a dream. So that is the activation synthesis hypothesis for what we dream. There's also a very specific type of dreaming known as lucid dreaming. And essentially what you need to know about this is that lucid dreaming is when you are suddenly aware to the fact that you are dreaming. It's really, really cool. Again, we talked about it a lot in class, um, but remembering what lucid dreaming is. Then we talked about some various sleep disorders. Um, so ones to really focus on uh, for the sake of the exam are things like narcolepsy. So narcolepsy is when you have these unexplained sleep attacks, which does not mean that you're attacking people in your sleep. It means that you just suddenly fall asleep. You're awake, you know, you suddenly fall asleep. We watched some videos about puppies that have narcolepsy uh, in class. So hopefully you were in class and you got to see those. If not, I believe I linked it um, in the Schoology account. Uh, so narcolepsy is a sleep disorder to pay attention to. Another one is more specifically, knowing the difference between nightmare disorder and sleep terror disorder. And in particular, it's knowing what stage of sleep it happens. So when we're talking about nightmares, which, you know, anyone experiences, um, though children have it more, the thing to remember is that nightmares happen during REM sleep. So it says, where's my mouse? There we go. Right here. That during REM sleep is when you have nightmares. The major difference with sleep terrors is it happens, as you see, during deeper levels of sleep. So you see it more in, like, the fourth stage of sleep. So remembering that nightmares happen in REM, sleep terror disorder happens in the fourth stage of sleep um, is very important. So we also talked about altered states, um, which, again, there's a question earlier on, but in more particular, we talked about hypnosis in class. And there's two different theories as to what's happening. Uh, the thing to focus on, um, is this neo-dissociation theory, and it's this whole idea that you split off um, or dissociate from yourself. So it's kind of your consciousness splitting off from itself, and you kind of watch yourself as you're being hip hypnotized. Um, so remembering that would be importante. Um, and then we talked about, also with altered states, uh, the use of drugs. And so there's going to be one question in particular, and I see that, it, um, I don't know if I can fix it while I'm recording. Yes, I can. There we go. Um, it was off a little bit. This whole idea of different types of dependence that we have on drugs. Skylar, I'm recording. Thank you. Um, so you have physiological dependence and psychological dependence. For the sake of this exam, when we talk about physiological, so spelled like this, do not confuse this with psychological, physiological dependence, this is when you have a physical dependence upon a drug. So your brain chemistry has changed. Um, so it's this whole idea that um, you're physically dependent upon it. Your brain has changed. Now if you don't have that drug, um, you're in serious... Uh, help our serious problem and then we talk about different kinds of drugs uh, so one that we talked about was depressants uh, the thing to know about depressants is what it does to your body and so depressants when you feel depressed when you are depressing something it means that it's going down it's decreasing and so what depressants do is they decrease um, your central nervous system. So again, looking here, it's all about reducing activity of the central nervous system. So that's what we mean by depressants. Um, the kind of opposite of that is then stimulants, also known as uppers. And what stimulants do is they're increasing your central nervous system. Um, and a thing to remember about stimulants, and chances are all of you have experienced it, but the most widely used one is caffeine. Um, so there's a couple questions um, about the most widely used uh, drugs in each category. 
For stimulants, it's caffeine, and quickly going back. For opioids, which is a depressant, um, and it's not written on here, but the thing to know, the most commonly used one, which is an issue in our area, as well as many others, is heroin. So to remember that the most commonly used opioid at this time is heroin. Moving on, we go into chapter 5. Uh, so this was all about learning, how we learn, how our brain works when we're learning, um, different ways that we learn or can teach, in a sense. And we start, uh, again, um, like the beginning of many chapters, uh, it's important to know what we mean when we say learning. And so for the sake of this class, when we talk about learning, what we mean is a relatively permanent change in behavior that is acquired through experience. You have some sort of an experience, whether it's being taught something, seeing something, you know, etc., being rewarded for something or punished for something, and from that experience, you've, for the most part, changed your behavior. You've learned. Um, so that's what we mean by learning. And the first thing that we learned about huh, for learning was classical conditioning. And there's many things you will need to know about this. One thing about classical conditioning is that it was accidentally founded by my, ma my man Ivan Pavlo, or Pavlov, again, depending on who your teacher is. I say Pavlo because that's what I was taught. Um, so Ivan Pavlo, you will need to know that name. There's a few names you will need to know. And then there'll be s a few, yeah, a few examples of classical conditioning. So you will need to remember that classical conditioning was essentially, it was when you were pairing something that you already respond to naturally um an automatic response you have an unconditioned stimulus which brings about an unconditioned response um so the example in the classic uh, classical conditioning one was a uh, dog salivating to food so you know you didn't need to learn to salivate to food it was unconditioned meaning unlearned and then it was paired with what was originally a neutral stimulus so just a bell um, which usually brings about no response and then it was paired with a conditioned response um, or sorry, with the unconditioned stimulus, which then makes it become the conditioned stimulus. Um, a huge thing to remember from this, uh, and I say this because there's multiple questions about this on the exam, when we talk about the neutral stimulus, it always becomes the conditioned stimulus. So you'll see that initially you didn't respond to the tone, you know, in the classic um, classical conditioning study. So the dogs initially did not respond, where's my mouse, there we go, did not respond to this tone. And then over time, after it was paired, it became conditioned, it became learned. So the neutral stimulus always becomes the conditioned stimulus. That's a huge thing to remember um, for the sake of this exam. There's also some things that can happen, um, and so I'm going to draw your attention. One is spontaneous recovery. So this is this whole idea that over time, when it's not paired with the unconditioned stimulus, um, like again, let's say that there's just the ringing of the bell, it's not paired with food, eventually the dog will learn not to salivate to the bell. But then randomly, it'll come back, spontaneously. Um, so there's an example about that on the exam, so to know that that's spontaneous recovery. Another example or another thing that's on the exam is these examples of stimulus generalization and stimulus discrimination. When you are generalizing a stimulus, it means that there's things that are similar to the stimulus that you still respond to. So the classic example that I gave in class is, let's say I get attacked by a giant black dog. And instead of just being afraid of giant black dogs, which would be stimulus discrimination, instead I'm just scared of all dogs. You know, it doesn't matter, you know, if it's black, white, brown, spotted, doesn't matter. I've generalized my response, um, and so I've generalized that stimulus. It's any sort of dog. So that is stimulus generalization. Another thing, and again, we talked about it in this class, was this whole idea of taste aversion. And this is the whole idea. It's a very, very strong version of classical conditioning where just having one bad experience with a food can put you off that food for life. That is a taste aversion. It's very strong. Um, the example that we had in class had to do with a tuna fish sandwich. So you have a tuna fish sandwich where the mayonnaise went off and you just, even the mention 
of tuna, you know, and you start feeling nauseous. That is a taste aversion. All right, so Thorndike, you will see this name again um, on the final exam. A lot of people always forget about Thorndike um, because of the person that we're about to talk about right after this. But the thing to remember about Thorndike is he came up with the idea of the law of effect. And this was the whole idea that, um, you know, if something good happens after you've done something, you're more likely to do that behavior. If something bad happens after you've done something, you're less likely to do it. That's the law of effect, which Thorndike came up with, which was then taken a step further by Skinner, who came up with what is known as operant conditioning. Um, so remembering that Thorndike is the law of effect, whereas Skinner is this whole idea of operant conditioning. And when we talk about operant conditioning, kind of the thing to focus on is it's this whole idea of rewards and punishments. And so when we talk about rewards or reinforcements, it's all about increasing a behavior. So whenever you see that word reinforcement, it's trying to increase a behavior, make it more likely to happen. And similar to what we talked about in class, and again, we did an activity about this, so hopefully um, this is ringing some bells, <laughs> um, is it can be positive or negative. And in psychology, positive means adding something, negative means taking away. Um, and so when we talk about a positive reinforcement, and you can always pause this video, again, these are directly from your PowerPoints, but a positive reinforcement is when we are adding something to, again, increase a behavior. Positive meaning adding, reinforcement means to increase a behavior. A negative reinforcement, then, on the other hand, is when we are taking away something, because it's negative, in order to still increase a behavior, because it is still a reinforcement. On the other hand, we then have punishments. Punishments are the opposite, where we're trying to decrease a behavior or make it less likely to happen. Um, and so that's what we mean when we talk about a punishment. And very similar uh, to reinforcements, it can be positive or negative. And again, positive meaning that we are adding something, negative meaning that we are taking something away. So a positive punishment would be adding something in order to decrease a behavior. A negative punishment would be taking away something in order to decrease a behavior. There we go. Um, and some other things that had to do with operant conditioning was this whole idea of shaping and successive approximation. Um, I showed a video in class of someone teaching a dog to um, bring the owner its slippers. And, you know, the person wasn't just sitting around waiting for the dog to bring the slippers and then rewarded the dog. The dog was never going to just naturally bring slippers. So instead it was rewarding approximate behavior. So when the dog picked up the shoe or touched the shoe, or I should say uh, slippers. So it's rewarding behavior that's similar to what you want and then slowly but surely getting it closer and closer to what you want so that is successive approximation which is being used in shaping um, some other things with operant conditioning are then the schedule of reinforcement so when you're reinforcing a behavior um, especially when you're giving some sort of a reward there's different ways that you can do it and again i'm not going to go into huge detail but you have it can either be fixed or it can be variable. Um, so fixed means that it's always the same. Variable meaning that, you know, it changes. And then it can either be a ratio or it can be an interval. And so a ratio has to do with an amount of something, whereas an interval has to do with time. So again, I'm going through it quickly, but a fixed ratio means, you know, it's like every 10 coffees you buy at a store, the 11th one's free. It's always every 10 coffees um, and then you're rewarded with that 11th free one. When it's a variable ratio, it would be, you know, sometimes it's 7 times, sometimes it's 9 times, sometimes it's 10, then it's 8. Like, the amount is different, but it's still an amount. This is different from interval that has to do with time. So let's say that, you know, after 5 minutes you get a reward, and every time it's after 5 minutes, that's a fixed interval. Whereas if it's changing, um, so, you know, it's 10 minutes and then you get a reward, two minutes and a reward, an hour, then you get a reward. It's varying, so that would be a variable interval. And 
all of these types of things, um, both classical conditioning and operant conditioning, if you're just trying to change a behavior, this is behavior modification. Um, so there's a question on the exam that talks about it, like just in general, trying to change behavior through a systematic program um, based on learning principles. That's behavior modification. You're trying to change a behavior, trying to modify behavior. It's behavior modification. Um, and then another way that we learn, so we talked about classical conditioning, we talked about operant conditioning, but there's ob also observational learning. And it might be hard to see on your screen, and I apologize, um, but it's this person, Albert Bandura, and he did, and there should have been a video for this um, that's still on Schoology if you haven't seen it, but it's this whole idea that, especially with children, they learn through watching and then replicating or mimicking what they see, and that's observational learning. Because sometimes you'll see that, you know, a person doesn't have to, you know, do something and it gets rewarded or punished, they just watch someone. They see what someone else did, and then they decide to do it themselves. So that's observational learning. Um, and then there's this whole idea of latent learning. Um, but the thing to take away from this, um, and we talked about this study in class with rats, is sometimes we don't see when someone's learned. Um, and in this study, rats went through mazes. Again, we talked about this in class. But they formed what we now call a cognitive map, which is this whole idea that, you know, with rats running through a maze, they had this idea in their head of, oh, okay, it's the second corner is where I need to turn. Um, and then I go to the right up here. Uh, oh, wait, no, I need to go straight down here. Like, you can see the directions in your own mind. And that's what we mean by a cognitive map. Um, if I told you, you know, how to get from the math hallway to the science hallway, you would almost see the hallway in your mind um, as you go through, you know, how to get from one area to the next, and that's a cognitive map. And that's it for learning. So then we get into chapter six. This was the first chapter that was online instruction only. Um, so again, watch those videos if any of this is confusing, because again, I'm going through it quickly. Um, but this had to do with, you know, how our memory works and then what happens when it doesn't work and we forget. Um, and unlike the other chapters, there is no question about what memory is and the definition of memory, but more so the process of it. Um, and do not confuse the process of memory with the stages of memory or the system of memory. When we talk about the process of memory, um, you will need to know that it goes in this order of encoding the information, storing the information, and then retrieving the information. So this is the process. So the process of memory is encoding, storage, and then retrieval. This is different from the stages of memory, um, or the system of memory. And those are you have the sensory memory, then you have short-term memory, and then you have long-term memory. So those, that's the system of memory, the stages of memory. Um, and hopefully you remember earlier in this video, I said to recall or remember huh, um, consolidation. That word comes up again, and I know it's not on this slide, but when you are taking information from short-term memory to long-term memory, that is consolidation. So going back to when we talked about the function of sleep and how it helps consolidate memories, what we mean by that is it's taking all those short-term memories, those things that you're going to forget, and deciding, okay, what needs to be remembered? What needs to stay in long-term memory? That is consolidation. Um, so remember that for the exam. And then just going through the different um, types of memory or system of memory, the stages of memory, there's different things you need to know for each. So when we talk about sensory memory, you will need to know the two different types, the iconic memory and the echoic memory. So when we talk about iconic, that's visual images. You can almost see a picture in your head. If I tell you, you know, to think of the Mona Lisa, um, for those of you who know that is, you can like picture it in your head. That's iconic. Then we have echoic memory, which is auditory. So if I tell you to think about, you know, your mother's voice, you can almost hear it, you know, in your, in your mind or, you know, your friend's voice, you know, something like that. Um, you know, your favorite song. So that's echoic. Um, 
and this has to do with sensory memory. So again, when I'm telling you to recall it, that's a little unfair to say. Um, but just to remember that iconic memory is those visual images. Echoic memory is the auditory. When we get to short-term memory, you will need to know all of these three terms. So we have chunking, maintenance rehearsal, and elaborative rehearsal. Chunking is this whole idea of breaking down information. Um, so for instance, if I'm trying to remember someone's number, I'm not just going to try to memorize all ten numbers, you know, each individual. It gets split up into three numbers, then three numbers, then four numbers. Um, and that makes it just easier to remember. You're putting it into meaningful bits, meaningful chunks. Um, these meaningful pieces. So that's chunking. We also have different ways that we rehearse information in our short-term memory, because short-term memory only lasts for 30 seconds, give or take. And so maintenance rehearsal is just you're maintaining that memory by repeating it over and over and over and over again. So that's maintenance rehearsal. It's just repeating the information. Elaborative rehearsal, rehearsal is a bit more, well, elaborative. You're making connections, you're making associations between existing information, things you already know, and then this new information. So again, um, I'm trying to remember someone's number. If I was doing maintenance rehearsal, I would just say the digits over and over and over again in my head. Okay, it's one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Elaborative rehearsal, I'd be like, oh, one, two, three, four. Hey, that's similar to my brother's number, who's one, two, three, five. So it's just like my brother's number, but the last digit's four. It's making that connection. And so that's short term. When we talk about long term, uh, long -term memory, uh, things to remember are the two different types of long term memory. And so we have this declarative memory, if I can find my mouse again, declarative memory, and then we have procedural memory. So just knowing those two different types of mem or long-term memory in particular, declarative memory and procedural. We then break this down, um, and you'll have an example about this on the exam, but you have two different types of declarative where it's semantic and episodic. So with these, semantic memory is kind of factual memories. It's something that's true for everyone. So, you know, what's the capital of Maryland? Um, that's a fact. It would be true for everybody. Episodic memory, on the other hand, is personal memories. So, you know, what did you do on your fifth birthday? If you ask a different person what they did on their fifth birthday, it's going to be different. Um, and so it's not the same for everyone. It's personal. And the way that I remember this is episodic is like the episodes of your life. Um, it's personal to you. Um, so there will be a question about that on the exam. There's also this idea of the constructionist theory. Um, and this goes into, well, what we're about to talk about the eyewitness testimonies, but it's the whole idea that when you are recalling something, um, when you're bringing something out of memory, it's not like a picture, and you're just bringing it out perfectly. You are, in fact, reconstructing that memory. Um, and so that's the constructionist theory. Um, and I can tell you with this question, it'll help you on the exam if you remember construction, and reconstruction, um, so it's reconstructing that memory, um, is the constructionist theory. And as I just mentioned, this brought was kind of brought to light with this idea of eyewitness testimonies, where people are trying to recall what they just saw that happened, you know, if they saw a crime, you know, things like that. And it's not as accurate as we would think, because again, we are reconstructing this memory. Um, so the thing to remember about eyewitness testimonies um, is the psychologist behind it, who is Elizabeth Loftus. Uh, so Elizabeth Loftus is the person to remember for the eyewitness testimony. So there's a few questions that have some names. All right, other things to know, and hopefully you did the activity for this in class, um, is serial position effect. The serial posi position effect is the whole idea that you will recall things better that are at the beginning of a list and at the end of the list, uh, more so than things kind of in the middle. A uh, classic example of this is when you're teaching a child the alphabet, the majority of the time they remember the beginning, A, B, C, D, and they remember the end, um, X, Y, Z. So it's because it's the first thing that they heard and the last thing that they heard. Um, but remembering both of those things is what we call the serial position effect. And when it comes to memories and forgetting, there's different theories as to how we forget. 
One theory, um, and as I mentioned, we're talking about him again, uh, was Freud's theory, and he had this whole idea of repression. And remember repression, because I can tell you right now on the exam, um, there is an option that says regression, which is something different, which we will be talking about. But it's a whole idea that when we are forgetting, we repress that memory, we push it down, um, and it causes us to forget. Uh, so if we have like a bad memory, you know, we'll make ourselves forget. That's repression. Um, it's uh, motivated forgetting. You want to forget that, and so you forget it. Um, so remember with repression, it's this whole idea of motivated forgetting. And then, when you're taking um, this exam, what you're doing is actually known as a recognition task. So when we're recalling information, um, or I shouldn't say recall, sorry, um, when we're remembering things, bringing it back, there's recall or recognition. Recall, you have to bring that information out. There can be various cues, but I mean, like, you really have to bring it out um, from your own mind, whereas recognition tasks is when the information is there in front of you. Classic example of recognition task is a multiple choice exam. So just like your uh, unit two test, you are doing a recognition task. You just have to recognize the answers. Um, and it always sounds weird to say, but again, on multiple choice exams, the answer's right there in front of you. You just have to recognize it. So it's a recognition task. And then we're almost done. We also have this whole idea of retroactive interference, um, which is the opposite of what we call proactive interference. And so the things to remember about this is retroactive interference is when you can't remember old information because new information is interfering with it. So if you're forgetting the old, that's retroactive um, inf interference. If you're forgetting new information because of old information, that is then proactive interference. Um, so there will be a question about this on the exam. Read it very, very carefully and think to yourself, okay, what are they forgetting? Are they forgetting the new information or are they forgetting the old information? And that will help you. Um, and remember, when it's all about like forgetting something because of new or old information, that's interference. That should not be confused with amnesia when you are forgetting something. And so there's two different types of amnesia. Again, you have retrograde, but then you also have enterograde. And so retrograde is when you can't remember anything from the past. So you wake up, you don't know who you are. Anterograde amnesia, on the other hand, is the opposite, where you do remember everything from the past, you just can't form new memories. So remembering the difference between those two things um, will help you, because again, there will be an example of that on the exam. Read it carefully. The only other thing, um, and there is no slide for it, I talked about it in the videos, but there's no slide for it, um, is this whole idea of a flashbulb memory. And the kind of classic example of that, um, and since this has nothing to do, I'm going to bring myself back. Ah, there we go. A flashbulb memory, um, the classic example of this is so many people remember exactly what they were doing on 9-11. Um, and they remember it vividly. And that's such an important word to remember is it's a vivid memory that you seem to be able to recall in great detail. And that's a flashbulb memory. Um, so that's the only other thing that there isn't an exact slide on it, but it is something that was discussed in class. Um, so the only other thing left is to wish you guys good luck. Um, I know you guys would do great on the exam. Uh, please remember that it is open book. It is open note. Use that to your advantage. You can also send me messages, send me emails, send me a remind if you have questions while you're taking the exam. I will clarify questions for you. I will reword those questions, but you have to reach out if you have a question. And then the only other thing, um, which I will not be showing the answer to, um, is there is an extra credit. And it has to do with memories and the formation of memories and where memories are stored in the brain. So a specific part of the brain. 
Um, and the hint that I will give on this is that the answer is in the PowerPoints. Um, it is in Chapter 6. Um, but that will be the extra credit question. Um, so that will be up to you to find. But everything else that I've gone over in this um, is going to be on that Unit 2 exam. So good luck to you all. I know you guys are going to do well. But let me know if you have questions. And that's it.